Hello, dear friends. Greetings in Jesus. We're looking today at the fundamentals of ecclesiology. The fundamentals of ecclesiology. The basic things about church organization, ministry, and church polity, church government. Ecclesiastical polity, church government, organization, and ministry. The fundamentals of ecclesiology. For a church to operate right, its foundation must be right. Otherwise, you wind up with the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Interesting to look at, perhaps, but not something that's going to stand very erectly. Maybe something that will eventually cave in. In fact, they usually do. If the foundation cracks, the building does not stand. As we always point out, unless the Lord builds a house, it cannot stand. The labor is labor in vain. But if the Lord builds, the foundation is always right. The foundation is Jesus himself, of course, and the apostles' teaching, Jesus being the cornerstone. We look in the book of Acts and we see what these fundamentals are. Turn with me, please, to one of the most read, yet one of the most misread chapters of the Bible and of the New Testament. The book of Acts, chapter 2, the second chapter of the book of Acts. The Greek word for to do, what the actions you perform is poeo, poeo. In Hebrew, the book of Acts is called mas hase hashlichim, what the apostles did, what the apostles did. Now we have to understand part of the nature of apostolic authority. Jesus taught the apostles personally how to interpret and apply his, teacher, his teachings practically. The epistles can be thought of as inspired commentary. They are inspired commentary. It's what the Holy Spirit inspired the apostles to write to interpret the rest of the Bible. If you want to understand the Gospels, read the Gospels through the prism of the epistles, through the prism of the apostles' teachings. If you want to understand the Old Testament, the purpose of the law, read Romans and Galatians. If you want to understand the sacrificial system in the book of Leviticus, read Hebrews. We always interpret the rest of Scripture, both the Old Testament and the Gospels, through the prism of the Apostles' teaching. The book of Acts, however, gives us something more. It gives us the Apostles' examples, not just the teaching itself, but how they practically lived it out, applied it, and demonstrated it for us and for all posterity, what the Apostles did. The birthday of the Church can often be referred to as the Day of Pentecost. Actually, the church already existed embryonically prior to the day of Pentecost, but it's not wrong to say its birthday was the day of Pentecost. We can, in some sense, say that. However, we have to understand that the day of Pentecost was the Hebrew feast of weeks, Hag Shavuot. It was one of the three principal pilgrim feasts from the book of Leviticus, chapters 23 and 24, and one of the four pilgrim feasts in the day of Jesus, Hanukkah being the additional one, beyond Passover, weeks, and Feast of Tabernacles, Hag Sukkot. So you had Pesach, was Passover. You had the Feast of Weeks, Hag Shavuot, which we call Pentecost. You had the Feast of Tabernacles, Hag Sukkot. And you had Hanukkah, which Jesus celebrated in John chapter 10. Jews would come from all over the known world, mainly the Roman Empire, to celebrate these pilgrim feasts. Now the rabbis calculated that the day of Pentecost, as Christians call it, the Feast of Weeks, was the same day when the law was given on Mount Sinai, or on Har Hodev. It was when the law of God was given. The same day the law was given is the same day the Holy Spirit was given. Now when the law was given, if you remember from the Old Testament account and the Tanakh and the Torah, when the law was given, 3,000 fell. Only when the Holy Spirit was given on the same day of the year of the lunar Jewish festal calendar, 3,000 were saved. When the law was given, 3,000 fell. When the Holy Spirit was given, 3,000 were saved. It's showing the contrast between the two covenants. The letter killeth, the law, but the Spirit giveth life, the new birth. It goes on beyond that. The early church would have understood the phenomena or the gift of tongues quite differently than most Christians do today. They would have related it in part to a messianic fulfillment of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 28. Because of the sin of the Tower of Babel, 
the vision came to mankind based on language. The early Christians saw the phenomena of tongue, glossolalia, or lashonot in Hebrew, glossolalia in Greek, as emblematic of the reversal of the curse on mankind from the Tower of Babel. Man lost his unity through sin at the Tower of Babel. The unity man lost through sin is regained in Christ. It's no longer based on language, ethnic identity, tribal identity. It's no longer based on national identity. It's based on nothing to do with birth. It's based on new birth. Hence, we understand something about tongues. The early church saw it as illustrating, demonstrating the unity that was lost through sin is now restored in Christ. It's no longer depending on birth, but on second birth. In the Mishnah, Jewish history, we read something, and again, it's only a historical source, not a biblical one, that when the law was given on the same day of the year on Mount Sinai, a whirlwind came from heaven. And deriving this from the table of nations in Genesis 10, 70 tongues or 70 languages were heard being spoken when the law was given to Moses. And so the same day of the year, when the Holy Spirit was given, the same phenomena recurs. That's the way the Jewish believers, the Messianic Jews, would have seen this. They would have seen this as the Messianic fulfillment of the Feast of Weeks. At that time, the high priest would have went into the synagogue and given a wave offering. Usually, wave offerings had no leaven, but these two loaves of bread had leaven. One for the Jew and one for the Gentile, waved before God. And in the synagogue, the book of Ruth is ritually read to this day, HaMegilat Ruth. It's a liturgical scroll. The book of Ruth is one of the five Megilot, or liturgical scroll readings, in the annual synagogue lection or, or, or liturgy. That's part of a special worship called Amak Zor. Amak Zor is a festal liturgy. The normal synagogue liturgy, as we'll see in a moment, was the Siddur, but here in the Amak Zor, for this day, part of the reading prescribed a reading of the book of Ruth, where you had a rich and powerful Jewish man who took a Gentile bride and exalted her. And through this came the lineage of David, to whom the Messiah would come. Jesus would be savior of both Jew and Gentile in the age of the church. Therefore, he had to come through a union of both Jew and Gentile. This is a consistent redemptive theme throughout scripture. Abraham was a Gentile who God converted to Judaism. Uh, because the seed of Abraham, the Messiah, would be savior of both Jew and Gentile. And so the lineage of the Messiah, the Davidic pedigree, had to come about from a union of Jew and Gentile because the Messiah, the son of David, would be savior of both Jew and Gentile. This was an important day in the Jewish calendar. And that's why you see Jews in the day of Pentecost gathered from all the nations. And so here they are at the birthday, as it were, of the church, as churches have traditionally described it. Bearing in mind, again, the church in an embryonic sense already existed. We know what happens when the Holy Spirit is given. And Peter gives his kerygma. Now we, we get in verse 37. Now when they heard this, Peter's preaching of the first evangelistic sermon, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then, those who had received the word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls again this is juxtaposed in contrast to the 3,000 who fell the same day of the year by the Jewish calendar when the law was given. And so the story continues. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bear. Again, the Hebrew liturgy in the synagogue or the temple is called a siddur, from the infinitive of the Hebrew, lesader, literally, to set in order. The order of these things is important. The order in which they did it was important. Notice the order again. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. Doctrine came first. To fellowship, that came second. The breaking of bread, implicit in which was the Lord's Supper, and finally to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. 
and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. So we see the beginning of the fundamentals of ecclesiology. A theologian from Cambridge University, where I studied for a while, in addition to London Bible College, was called C.H. Dodd. And Dodd was not incorrect when he identified three basic kinds of preaching in the early church, revealed in and through the New Testament. Three kinds. The first kind was kerygma, kerygmatic preaching. This was Peter's kerygma. Kerygma is preaching the gospel to the unsaved, proclaiming the need for repentance and new birth. That is kerygma, evangelism. Then there is homelia, homelia, exhortation. Kerygma is preaching the gospel. Homelia is exhorting people to live it. A life of co-death and co-resurrection in the power of Christ, filled with his spirit. Kerygma is evangelism. Homelia is exhortation. Kerygma is proclaiming the gospel to the unsaved. Homelia is encouraging people to live it. Then there is the Daskin, doctrine, doctrinal teaching, teaching of Jesus. There was, there's a heretic in the United States called Paul Crouch from TBN, and he referred to doctrine as excrement on television in America. No, the teaching of Jesus, Mr. Crouch, is not excrement. TBN is excrement. The teaching of Jesus is the Daskin. If you love him, keep his commandments. I have to assume you obviously don't, or you wouldn't teach such blasphemy. Kerygma, Hamelia, and Didaskin. Evangelism, exhortation, and doctrinal teaching. Think of a tripod. A tripod. For a tripod to stand, it must have three legs. It doesn't matter how good the other two legs are. If the third leg is missing, the tripod, by definition, will not stand. For a church to stand biblically, in fact, for a church to really stand spiritually, it must have all three legs. It must be evangelistic, it must exhort the congregation, and it must have doctrinal teaching. If any of those three things is missing, it will not stand. If a church or a fellowship stops being evangelistic, it will soon stop being evangelical. If any ministry stops being evangelistic, it'll soon stop being evangelical. They'll wind up with a social gospel and usually a political agenda, as we see has happened to Tear Fund in New Zealand, or to World Vision, or to uh, Bernardo's. These organizations began as gospel preaching, but now their gospel is not the new birth, it is merely social. They're social political organizations with a Christian heritage, using Christian trappings and Christian decoration, but they're not biblically Christian, yet they were. Kerygma must be there. Secondly, homelia must be there, People must be exhorted to believe, not only in intellectually believe, but to believe in terms of the way they live. And thirdly, the Daskin, right doctrine. When Paul gives his instruction to Timothy, an older pastor, an apostle, instructing a younger pastor how to pastor, the first words out of his mouth in that pastoral epistle, speak the things fitting for sound doctrine. Right doctrine comes first. More about this in a moment. Kerygma, Hamelia, the Daskin. We see all three in the book of Acts, and they are fundamental. If one of the three is missing, the church will not stand in any biblical sense of the word stand. However, when Peter preaches, look at the way he preaches. Peter, I'm afraid, had to disagree with people like Bill Hybels, John Wimber, and Rick Warren. He was not seeker-friendly. He was not seeker-sensitive. Now, we're not talking again about preaching at people with the turn or burn stuff. That's not preaching to people, it's preaching at them. However, the scripture is clear. 
Save yourself from this perverse generation. People were told it's appointed to man once to die and after this to judgment. Hell is a reality, Satan is a reality, judgment is a reality, and we're all guilty unless Jesus takes our sin and gives us his righteousness. Unless we die with him and raise in the power of his resurrection, we are doomed. So they say, brethren, what shall we do? Peter understood, unless you preach law, you cannot preach grace. And Peter said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Notice there was a command to repent. The Hebrew word for repent is this word. Teshuvah. Teshuvah. The Greek word Metanoia. Metanoia. As a Jew speaking Aramaic with a knowledge of Hebrew, Peter almost certainly was speaking of Teshuvah. Teshuvah from the Hebrew Shuv, to return. The Hebrew idea of repentance is to turn from sin towards God. To turn from sin towards God. It's not simply being apologetic for having done something wrong. It is turning from it towards God. Unless there is a turning, there is no real repentance. We live in the age of cheap grace, where people just say, every eye closed, every head bowed. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Accept Jesus into your heart. Slip your hand up. Accept Jesus. God loves you. Thank you, brother. I see you. Thank you. This is a lot of silly garbage. It is not biblical repentance. It is not biblical evangelism. It is seeker-friendly, it is seeker-sensitive, but it is not biblical. It is a formula for false conversion, for people who are never really saved to begin with. There must be a conviction of sin, an eclectic of the Holy Spirit, and an understanding that you are judged and doomed unto hell, and that God loves you so much that he became a man to pay the price so you wouldn't go there. You are doomed until you accept Jesus Christ. Repent, turn from it. If you don't turn from it, forget it. If somebody is diagnosed with lung cancer or emphysema, what's the first thing the physician tells them to do? Stop smoking. Stop doing the thing that got you in this mess to begin with. Before we talk about therapy, before we talk about surgery, before we talk about healing, let's talk about what caused it. Stop smoking. If you don't want to stop smoking, you're wasting your time. What are you coming to me for? Well, it's the same idea. Repent. Teshuvah. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God rests upon him. Mere intellectual belief is not good enough. This is platonic. It is not biblical. Such ideas permeated the church in the patristic era. I believe. You can believe intellectually. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son shall not see life. If your belief is real, if it's not only here but here, you will turn from the way you're living towards the way God says you should live, because you'll have turned to God himself. Teshuvah is a call to repentance. No, you cannot keep living the way you're living. No, you cannot keep getting drunk. No, you cannot keep gambling. No, you cannot keep smoking. We're not talking here about legalism, trying to be saved by works and do's and don'ts. We're talking about a relationship. When people have a real relationship with Jesus, they won't want to do those things anymore, and God will give them the power to stop doing the things that hurt them and hurt others. Teshuvah, there must be a repentance. Metanoia is the other word. In the medieval church, the Roman Catholic Church misled people who could not really even read the Vulgate, which was a bad Latin translation of the Bible anyway, into thinking that the word, the humanist scholar left of viewer Martin Luther learned that the word meant to repent, to turn. In biblical ecclesiology, evangelism comes first. Kerygma comes first. And the first principle of biblical evangelism, biblical kerygma, is a call to repentance. But he says something else. Repent and be 
baptism. I'm using the English spelling here instead of the American. Baptism. What is baptism? But why does he say to be baptized in the name of who? He says to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Again, when the scriptures say Jesus Christ, it's him on earth. When it says Christ Jesus, it's him in eternity. Into Jesus Christ. In other words, baptism is co-death and co-resurrection. When you go under the water, you co-die with him. When you come out, you're co-resurrected. The old nature dies with Christ. The new one is co-resurrected unto eternal life. That's what it means. It means by immersion. But why does it specify Jesus Christ? Simply because both the Jews and the pagans had baptismal rituals. Jews had baptismal rituals called mikvaot, mikvahs, a mikvah. There were all kinds of baptismal rituals. The Essenes had multiple baptisms. After a, a, after a normal menstrual cycle, a Jewish woman, before she would be tahor, ritually clean, she had to undergo a mikvah, a baptismal ritual. Orthodox Jewish women do it to this day. John the Baptist preached a mikvah unto repentance. The Jews had all kinds of baptisms. So to distinguish between ordinary baptism and the name of God, it had to be in the name of Jesus, God who became a man. There were heretics who later sprung up after the apostles called Sabellians, and people with false doctrines about Christ called modelists. These people had the idea that the Father is Jesus, Jesus is Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is Jesus. This is an ancient heresy. When, Peter was, uh, when, when Stephen was being martyred in the book of Acts chapter 7, he saw Jesus at the right hand of the Father. The right hand of the Father. Did he see one or two? Now, I actually had one person who's in a Jesus-only cult try to state that if you were being hit in the head with rocks, you'd be seeing double as well. That was his argument. Blithering nonsense. When you see people making an issue of Jesus-only baptism, the real issue with them is not baptism. Understand the real issue with them is almost inevitably the triunity of the Godhead, one God and three persons. That's their problem. The issue is not baptism. The issue is, is it one God and three persons? Well, the Bible says, yes, it is. Now, I'm not insistent on the word trinity. I prefer the word triunity. But the doctrine of one God and three persons is thoroughly biblical. Jesus is God. The Father is God. The Holy Spirit is God. There is one God but three persons. So they had to be baptized in the name of Jesus to distinguish it from existing models of Jewish baptism. There were also pagan models of baptism such as the Greeks being baptized on behalf of the dead. This was a pagan practice that Paul refers to in 1 Corinthians 15. Somehow the Mormons actually attempt to make this a Christian doctrine. I have a copy of the birth certificates, the death certificates, the wedding certificate, and the baptismal certificate of Adolf Hitler and Eva Braun. The Mormons claim they saved Adolf Hitler by baptizing them on beha after they posthumously, after they were dead, and eternally sealing their marriage. We actually have photocopies of the, of, of the Mormon baptismal certificates, wedding certificates, and death and birth certificates of Hitler and Eva Braun, saying that they were saved in a temple in Utah. Absolutely nuts. It was a pagan practice. The need for baptism in the name of Jesus was to distinguish it from other forms of existing Jewish and pagan baptism. Repent and be baptized. Now let's understand something. We have people who are called oncers, and we have people who are called twicers. Does it all happen when you receive Jesus, or is there a second experience? Let's understand the nature of baptism. Turn with me, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 1, I do not want you, my brethren, to be unaware that our fathers were all under the cloud and passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. The sea, obviously, is water baptism. The cloud was the Shekinah, spirit baptism. Notice the two baptisms are one, water and spirit. 
Let's understand this. What baptism does, and all it does, is it takes an objective truth and makes it a subjective experience. The positional truth becomes experientially true. Okay? When somebody is born again, they receive the Holy Spirit. When somebody truly repents of their sin and prays to receive Jesus, they become a new creation. Okay. It's already a reality that they've died with Christ and become a new creation. What baptism does is takes the objective truth and make it a subjective reality in the person's life. That's why we're told in Romans chapter 6, you were baptized into his death. Under the water is co-death, coming out is co-life. If you're a saved Christian and you see a hearse driving by, carrying a casket to a cemetery or crematorium, it's irrelevant to you for the simple reason your funeral is over. Your funeral happened when you were baptized in water. Real birth is second birth, real death is second death, and your funeral is a past event that was your baptism. It's irrelevant to us. Baptism. Think of a corpse, an unburied corpse, an embalmed corpse. Someone is objectively dead. They may have had an autopsy, a post-mortem. We know the cause of death. They embalm the corpse. You're looking at the person. No, you're looking at the remains of the person. They've given up the ghost. But the illusion that they are still with us is there. The illusion that they're still with us is there. Not until you take the corpse and put it in the grave has the objective reality become a subjective experience. Not until the corpse is buried has the objective become subjective. You put the corpse in the ground and bury it. That is a declaration of finality. I accept the fact he is dead. I accept the fact she is dead. Until the resurrection, if they're a Christian, they're asleep in the Lord, that's it. They'll come back, they've gone to be with Jesus. Otherwise, they're in hell, but either way, they're not with us. A corpse creates the illusion of still being with us. Objectively, we know they're gone. Subjectively, the illusion is still with us. Think of an unburied corpse. It gets pretty foul after a while. In the Middle East, it would get foul very quickly. Lividity would set in, and so would very rapid rigor mortis. It could spread disease in that climate, and so God said bury them before the next sundown. Don't wait to get baptized. There is no reason to delay believers' baptism. However, who in their right mind would take a little baby out of a cot or a crib or a pram and put it into a casket and bury it if it wasn't dead? A deranged sicko? A psychopath? Well, infant baptism is a psychopath doctrine. I'm not in any way demeaning the faith of people who practice it in sincerity. I believe in dedicating children. But the idea of holding a funeral for somebody before they're dead is ludicrous. Not only that, if you begin telling people that they're Christians because they were baptized or implying that they were Christians, well, you've had your funeral, you must be dead, now you have to die, it's stupid. You have to accept Jesus into your heart. Well, well, wait a minute. If I'm not dead in Christ, if I'm not a new creation, why did you bury me? It's a contradiction in theology, it's a logical contradiction, and it's a nonsense. It basically came about after Constantine Christianized the Roman Empire and made it a religion of the state. Absolutely ludicrous. Churches that practice believers' baptism are perverting the gospel fundamentally. I'm not saying they're not people who do it who aren't saved, but I'm saying if you are saved, you need to get baptized as a believer and find yourself a church that will do it. One of the worst things you can do is pronounce somebody a Christian when they're not. In the old traditional Book of Common Prayer used by the Anglicans worldwide, it pronounced new birth through baptism. This is a Roman Catholic doctrine. It is not a biblical doctrine. A case in England where a young man prayed to receive the Lord at an, at an evangelical Anglican church at a youth meeting. And he came, Vicar Green, Vicar Green, I accepted Jesus at the youth meeting on Tuesday. And the vicar said, yes, I know. We've been praying for your salvation for some time. Well, Vicar Green, you were also the same vicar who baptized me. Oh, yes, you were such a cute little baby. Your parents were so proud. I remember the day well. Well, in the Book of Common Prayer, it says, I was born again then. Now you're telling me I was born again last Tuesday. Were you lying when I was a baby, or are you lying now, Vicar Green? Or is it that you're just a religious babbler who don't know what you're talking about?
It is not biblical. Baptism is the first step of biblical discipleship. It is part and parcel of kerygma, a call to repentance and a call to baptism. Another way to look upon baptism is an unconsummated marriage. Jack and Jill meet in church. Jack and Jill are attracted. Jack and Jill fall in love. Jack and Jill get engaged. Jack and Jill get married. They have a lovely wedding. So they come into church as two and they walk out one because first and foremostly they take a vow to God. So as far as God's concerned, God has joined them together. They took a vow. God says Jack and Jill are one. Secondly, the church says Jack and Jill are one because the church has just performed the nuptial ceremony and the preacher pronounced them one. Thirdly, the law says they're one because they've entered into a legal contract. The state says they're one. They're in a contractual relationship we call marriage. The church calls it holy matrimony. God, the law, the church says they're one. And because they've exchanged vows and rings or whatever, Jack and Jill say they're one. Everybody says Jack and Jill are one. When they walk out of the church, they are objectively one. Not until they consummate their marriage, however, does the objective truth of being one become a subjective experience. In fact, that is what the Hebrew means. The fundamental prayer of the Hebrew faith, the confession, when they asked Jesus the greatest commandment, he said, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is oneness. It is the same term used for becoming one flesh in holy matrimony. Oh, objectively, they're one from the moment they say, I do, when the preacher pronounces them, and they've entered the contract, etc. They're objectively one, but only once they physically become one has the objective oneness become a subjective oneness has the positional truth become an experiential truth? Is it natural not to bury a corpse? No, it is not. Is it natural to have an unconsummated marriage? No, it is not. But then we get to the issue of water baptism and spirit baptism. We have the oncers and the twicers. Brother, have you had the second blessing? Don't tell me that Pentecostal charismatic stuff. I had it all when I was born again. I got the Holy Spirit when I was saved. Who is right, the oncers or the twicers? Neither are right. The oncers are wrong and the twicers are wrong. Turn with me, please, to the Gospel of St. John. Biblically, neither are correct. Let us look. John chapter 20, after Jesus dies, takes their sin and raises from the dead and takes our sin, it says he breathed on them, hearkening back to the imagery of God creating Adam, breathing into Adam, putting his spirit inside of him. When man was created, now man is a new creation based on the atonement of Christ and his resurrection. And Jesus breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. The apostles are born again when Jesus breathes on them. He's died for their sin, rose from the dead, now they've had new birth. But then he tells them to go to Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit. They're to go wait for what they already have. The objective has to become subjective. The positional has to become experiential. And so on the day of Pentecost, we read what happens in the book of Acts chapter 2. They were all gathered together, and in verse 4, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, that's a second. See, I told you there was a second experience in grace. Wrong. Turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 4. Verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Who? 
The same apostles from the day of Pentecost. The same ones Jesus breathed on. It's not a once or twice. There's a third. And it's a fourth, a fifth, a sixth. Let's go back to Jack and Jill. Suppose Jack and Jill got married. Now they're one. Suppose Jack and Jill go on their honeymoon to the Bay of Islands or the, to Hawaii or to Switzerland. And Jack and Jill consummate their marriage. Now the objective has become a subjective experience. Suppose Jack and Jill come back for their honeymoon and say, that was wonderful. 25 years from now, we're going to have a second honeymoon and do it again. It's not normal. It's not a once or twice. It's a third, a fourth, a fifth. One baptism, many fillings. Now there may be something unique or special about the first time by virtue of the fact it's the first time. There may be something, well, nobody says there's not something special about the first time, simply because it's the first time. But in theory, it should become ongoing, frequent, and get better. The Holy Spirit always indwells us. But let's look carefully at Acts chapter 2. The first thing we see in verse 4 is the filling of the Holy Spirit. Later on in Acts chapter 2, in verse 33, we see it is called the promise of the Holy Spirit. When the 3,000 are saved, Peter tells them in verse 38, They'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But initially, it's just called waiting for the Holy Spirit. And elsewhere in the book of Acts, it's called baptism of the Holy Spirit. You have five terms, five terms for the same thing. They are virtually or nearly synonymous. They're synonymous in that they all refer to the same thing, but each term highlights a different aspect of that thing. There's the aspect of filling, the aspect of promise, the aspect of gift, aspect of baptism, each term highlights a different aspect of that same thing, but it's all the same thing. Part of the problem happens when somebody takes one of these terms. Have you had the filling of the Spirit? Are you Spirit-filled? Have you had the baptism of the Holy Ghost? When somebody takes their term and makes it a template for everyone else, not understanding that the book of Acts uses five terms for the same thing. Now what does baptism do? Once you're born again, you've died with Christ and become a new creation. The Holy Spirit is inside of you. But you're not baptized yet. The objective has not become a subjective until you go under the water. Being baptized in the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, call it what you will, is the same thing. The Holy Spirit is already in you. But it becomes a subjective experience in your life. Not one, many. It's poured out from Jesus onto the church. Now, there's much more we can say about this on the baptism tape. But notice we have three kinds of variations in the book of Acts. A variation of terms. But we also have a variation of chronology. The apostles were born again and then they were filled or baptized with the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 8, a turning point in the church with the Samaritans, the Samaritans were born again, then they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, similarly. The first Gentile saved in Acts chapter 10, Cornelius and his family, they were born again, 
baptized in the Holy Spirit, and then baptized in water. On the day of Pentecost, unlike the 120 or the apostles, the 3,000 were not like the 120. The 3,000 got the same thing all at the same time. They were baptized in water and at the Holy Spirit all at the same time. You have different chronologies. The only chronology you don't have is the perversion of infant baptism. Somebody being baptized before they're born again. It doesn't matter if somebody is born again, then baptized in water, then filled with the Spirit. It doesn't matter if they're born again, baptized, and filled with the Spirit at the same time. It doesn't matter if they're baptized, then filled with the Spirit, then baptized in water. The chronology doesn't matter. What matters is the end product. The book of Acts allows for all of it, except infant baptism or baptizing an unregenerate person. No, it's not once or twice. Both of those things are silly. But then you have a third variation. You have a variation in terminology, in chronology, but experience. People have to distinguish between the proscriptive and the descriptive. Let's look at the day of Pentecost, all the nations the people were from. As Galileans, the apostles would have spoken Judean, uh, and, and Judean would have both spoken Aramaic. They would have both spoken Aramaic. Galileans and Judeans both would have spoken the same language with a different accent, but the same language. Okay. Let's look at verse 9. Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia. There were people there from Judea saying, are these men not all Galileans? Well, if they all heard it in their own language, some of them must have heard it in Aramaic. They must have heard it in their own language. You cannot even prove from the day of Pentecost, the book of Acts, you cannot exegetically prove from Acts chapter 2 that they all spoke in another tongue other than their own. If there were Judeans there and they heard it in their own language, some of them must have been speaking Aramaic. Now, they may have switched languages. We don't know, but that's reading something into the text that doesn't say. You cannot prove they all had another language from the context. Do I believe in the gift of tongues? Yes. Have I ever prayed in tongues? In fact, I have, but I don't make a big deal out of it, and I don't think there's something wrong with you if you haven't. Tongues can be purely psychological. It can be learned or contrived. It can be demonic. It can be some combination of those things. Or it can be an authentic gift of the Holy Spirit. But there is no difference be between the sign of tongues and gift of tongues. It may or may not happen with spirit baptism. The proof of spirit baptism will be two things. Wind and fire. Holiness and power. Remember, it was the charismatic Corinthians, the most charismatic church we have a record of in the New Testament, who needed to be reminded that the Holy Spirit was the spirit of holiness. That's what it means in Hebrew, Haruaka Kodesh. If you find people living carnally and doing carnal things, like you saw at Pensacola and Toronto, that's not the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control, ikrete in Greek, not the lack of it. That stuff is nonsense. There will be wind and fire. There may or may not be tongues, and one or more of the gifts of the Spirit, the charismatic gifts, will manifest in that person's life, for sure, eventually. But look for holy living, look for power. Power to carry out the ministry God's called you to. We have three different variations. Baptism was fundamental. Notice it was fundamental. It accompanied the gospel. You will not find believer's baptism in an alpha course. That is one of the many reasons it is not biblical. Repentance and baptism were central to biblical kerygma. Baptism is the first step to discipleship. An unburied corpse, an unconsummated marriage, an unbaptized Christian. That's what it comes to. Now look what Peter says. He kept on exhorting them, save yourself from this perverse generation. No, he was not seeker friendly. He was not a Bill Hybels fan or a John Wimber fan or a Rick Warren fan. Nobody who God has ever used to bring revival preached that way. Not Charles Wesley, not John Wesley, not George Whitfield, not D.L. Moody, not Jonathan Edwards, not Charles Spurgeon. 
No real evangelist who God ever used to bring revival ever gave this mamby-pamby, seeker-sensitive rubbish that is based on marketing and psychology and emotional manipulation. None. They always preached the way the apostles did. Save yourself from this perverse generation. Repent and be baptized. That is the biblical message. It's the biblical message. When they didn't, they didn't last too long. Methodism went off the tracks in John Wesley's own day because the, imp because the emphasis on baptism was compromised. That is part of the reason. Repent and be baptized. Not a seeker-sensitive presentation of the gospel. There's nothing friendly about the cross. But let's continue. After the kerygma came the exhortation. So those who received the word were baptized that day. There were added 3,000 souls. And they were continually devoting themselves to four things. Continually devoting themselves to four things things. The first thing they continually devoted themselves to was the apostles teaching the Daskin learning doctrine learning doctrine unity of the Holy Spirit depends on common doctrine. One faith one baptism. Common doctrine. If there is not a common body of belief, there is not a real unity. Today we have people uniting with churches that say salvation is by the sacraments instead of the new birth. Uniting in the name of unity, some perverted, twisted concept of unity. Saying that it's okay if you believe in praying to the dead. It's okay if you believe in transubstantiation and it's okay if you believe you're going to atone in purgatory for your own sin. No, you will not atone in purgatory for your own sin. The blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. You cannot have a unity of the Spirit based on a lie. Jesus tells us the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth, not of error. When he prayed we would be one, he prefaced his prayer, his high priestly prayer, by saying, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. If people do not have true doctrine, there cannot be real unity. There can be some ecumenical deception, some road to Babylon, but there will not be any biblical unity. That depends on common doctrine. Doctrine always comes first. Why? Even in the armor of God in Ephesians 6, before they put on the breastplate of righteousness, they had to put on the gird of truth. Why does truth precede even righteousness? Because if you don't know what truth is, you won't know what righteousness is. You'll have a so-called born-again Catholic praying in tongues to Mary, committing the sin of necromancy, thinking it's somehow Christian. You'll have people accepting infant baptism as, 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 as believer's baptism. Unless you have right doctrine, you won't know what right conduct is. Truth comes first, and truth is the apostles' teaching because it is the teaching of Jesus, the Daskin. If that leg is missing, even if the true gospel is preached, the tripod falls. It doesn't matter if people are saved through Alpha courses or if Benny Hinn are being purpose-driven. If there's no biblical model of discipleship, if there's no didaskin, if there's no doctrine, the tripod falls. It's useless. Jesus never said to make converts. He said to make disciples. Let us look at the Great Commission, please, at the end of the Gospel of St. Matthew. Jesus says this, Go therefore and make converts, no, make disciples. Well, how do you do that? To begin with, baptizing them. Believer's baptism. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All three persons of the Godhead are involved in the creation, and all three are involved in the new creation. We're saved by Jesus when the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, and he puts his spirit inside of our spirit. No one comes unless the Father draws him. You've got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All three persons are involved in the creation. All three persons are involved in the new creation. Yet a few years ago, you had a silly, unbiblical book, which demeans the epistles, as dusty old letters called the God Chasers, written by a man with beliefs that come from a background which denies the Trinity. And people will read such garbage, thinking it's somehow Christian. 
There's nothing Christian about it, certainly not in the biblical sense. There's nothing biblically Christian about Alpha courses. Nothing. Jesus never said to make converts, he said make disciples. Where's the believer's baptism? The purpose of Alpha Course is, according to the Alpha Times and Nicky Gumbel, with the Holy Spirit weekend away to get people into the Toronto deception. Instead of the fruit of the Spirit being self-control, it becomes the lack of it. People on the floor in drunken hysterics, imitating animals and all sorts, they're silly enough to think that that's somehow something to do with God. It is to do with God, the God of this world, not the God of the Bible. Doctrine comes first. That is the first thing they devoted themselves to, but it says they continually devoted themselves to it. How can you continually devote yourself to the apostles' teaching? Can we all go to a theological seminary or Bible college, like yeshiva boys, all day from morning to night and have Bible studies 24-7? To be continually devoted to teaching doesn't mean you study it all the time although you have to study to show yourself approved. If you don't study, you're not approved by God. No, we're continually devoted to it by living it out. Anybody can be religious in a church or in a Christian meeting or a Bible study or a home group. It's not what happens at a Bible study or at a Christian meeting or worship service that's most important. It's what happens when we leave. How do we apply what we've heard and what's been put into us. To be continually devoted to the doctrine means to live it out. How spiritual am I in church? Well, I can be quite spiritual in church. How spiritual am I when I'm stuck in traffic on my way to a church and I have to speak in front of several hundred people and there's a, a lorry driven by somebody with a cigarette in one hand and a cell phone in the other? My indignation may be right, but my desire to shoot him isn't. <laughs> Living it out. Let's continue. Continually devoted to the apostles' teaching, the Daskin. What else are they continually devoted to? Fellowship. Not coming to church, but koinonia, chita brut, being cemented together. Not in the Maoist sense of personality cloning, but in each knowing his own gift, whether you're an eye, a foot, or a hand. The eye is the lamp of the body, but thy word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. Who are the eyes? Teachers. How lovely on the mountain are the feet of him who brings good news. Therefore, in Ephesians 6, shod your feet with the shoes of the gospel of peace. Who are the feet? Evangelists but we're all under the head, Christ. Turn with me to the book of Psalms, please. We read, Psalm 133, Hine matov umanayim shevetahim gam yachad. How good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious oil upon the head, coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, coming down upon the edge of his robes. We know that Aaron and the Hebrew high priest are pictures of Christ. The epistles of Hebrew tells us they're shadows of the Messiah. He's the anointed one. He is Hamashiach, Ho Christo, the anointed one. Our anointing depends on being under his head. Notice the oil never touches the flesh. It goes off the, the head, over the, off the beard, and over the robes. It never touches the flesh. Well, somebody gets saved through it. Yeah, I know his doctrine is false, but people get healed through it. It's nothing to do with him. The oil never touches the flesh. Many will come to me and say, Lord, did we not do miracles in your name? Yes, you did. Now get lost. I never knew you. They proved nothing about anyone except Jesus if they're real, and many of what, much of what you see today isn't. You can be a very good eye, have the gift of teaching. You can be a very good evangelist. Oh, you can hear the voice of God, you can be a prophet, you can be a whatever. But it's no good unless it's attached to the body 
and under the head. An eye is no good in a bottle of formula and on the windowsill, and a foot is no good standing in the corner. It's ridiculous. It must be attached to the body and under the head. Fellowship. One of the most important verses to do with fellowship in the Bible is iron sharpens iron, thus a man strengthens his friend's countenance. The Hebrew word chichuch. <coughs> Friction. She rubs me the wrong way. She's supposed to. The first and foremost kind of fellowship God ordained is holy matrimony. Let's go back to our two friends, Jack and Jill. When Jack and Jill go off on that honeymoon we talked about earlier, Jack and Jill were in love. With love. <laughs> I love you because, because, because. 10, 12, 15 years later, it's I love you despite, despite, despite. Then Jack and Jill are in love. They were in love with love. Now they're in love with each other. The test of the marriage is not that there's no friction, but does the marriage grow despite it and even to a degree because of it? The test of a fellowship is not that there's no friction. Everything is always lovey-dovey, mamby-pamby. God brings us into fellowship with those who will rub us the wrong way and us them to make us both more like Jesus. We fight over moral issues and we fight over doctrinal issues but we don't fight over personal and political issues. That's not a good enough reason to walk out of a marriage, a personality conflict. You should have thought of that before you made the commitment. So it is. People who are out of fellowship are out of God's will. In the last days, these people will fall away. Hebrews 10, 25. Forsake not the fellowshipping together, especially as you see the day approaching. This is using something called kalvahomer, first principle of Midrash from the Medot of Rabbi Hillel. If you can't stand in a good time, you're never going to stand in a bad time. If you can't stand together when there's no persecution, what will happen when deception and persecution multiply and you have to stand alone? Those people will fall away. Proverbs 18.1, he who remains alone quarrels against all wisdom and seeks their own desire. No matter what reason someone gives you for not being in fellowship, what it really comes down to is their arguments are quarreling against all wisdom and they're seeking their own desire, not what God knows is best for them and best for others. Now, I accept the fact that there are people who cannot find the biblical church near where they live. I accept that. It's getting more difficult to find good churches these days, even biblical churches. However, who said a church has to be in a building? Meet in a home. Meet with other like-minded believers in a home in a committed relationship. Who said you have to meet in a church in the sense of a building? Yes, you have to be a church, but not meet in one. The Bible never teaches any such thing. Fellowship. Fellowship. Koinonia, the community life, not just attending meetings, but being part of the body under the headship of Christ, exercising your gift under the control of the head, in harmony and coordination with others. You walk where you're going. Your eye is related to your foot. But it's coordinated by the brain, the head. That's fellowship. I don't like my feet. They're too big. Tough, they're yours. Live with it. I don't like the music director. Tough, that's your brother. That's your sister. There's going to be friction. Friction is one of the things God uses to deal with our old nature. We only fight over doctrinal and moral issues, ethical issues. We don't fight over personality conflicts. Fellowship comes second. Look what comes next. The breaking of bread. The early Christian had agapes, love feasts, in which they took the Lord's Supper. Now understand the Lord's Supper is very different when you understand it comes from the Passover. For one thing, the Jews were told in Exodus 13, when your children ask you why you eat the Passover, it's because of what the Lord God did when he took me out of Egypt. 
Children want to be like their parents. Even educational psychology acknowledges that. Why do you take the Lord's Supper? Because of what Jesus did when he took me out of the world, Egypt being a symbol of the world. When our children were little, our children were born in Israel, when they came to England, our daughter was baptized, our son wasn't. And our son would see that his older sister, his mother, and his father were taking the Lord's Supper. He couldn't. But this is my family. What's wrong with me? Am I not fully a part of them? Well, no, Eli, you're not. You have to put your faith in Jesus and be baptized. Then you can take this. It's a way to teach your children. When someone is facing the imminency of biological death, if someone is terminally ill and God's not going to heal them, the Lord's Supper is the way that God gave to prepare us for bereavement and for facing going to be with him and leaving this world temporarily. Jesus knew he was going to die the cruelest of deaths, and when you're going to die, you don't spend your time talking about the pop charts or about the rugby scores. You spend your time talking about the things that are most important, spending your time with those who are most important to you. And he said, I long to eat the Passover, the Pesach, with you, but I say to you, I will not do this again until we do it in the kingdom of my Father. When we take the Lord's Supper as a body, as families, as married couples, as parents with children, as siblings, we're saying, the Lord may not come first. We may go to be with him first. But if I go to be with him before you do, or you go to be with him before I do, I die, you die, we both die, we become temporarily separated by biological death. The same as we eat this bread and drink this cup now, we're going to do it again at the marriage supper of the Lamb. The Passover is a looking back and a looking forward. The Jews look back to the redemption out of Egypt, but are looking forward to the coming of the Messiah, and so we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We look back to Calvary, but we look forward to the marriage supper of the Lamb. If someone is terminally ill, what they need to do is to take the Lord's Supper with their loved ones. The same as we do it now, we're going to do it again. You'll see the benefit that has both spiritually and emotionally. Not only for the person who's ill, but for his family. And it will make it much easier for them to handle the bereavement. It's the way the Lord ordained for us to do it. But you just can't come and do it. Eating the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner can result in physical illness and even biological death. It's a way the Lord uses to keep us right. Keep us repenting. If you strain relationships, remember, it's a siddur. The order is important. Get the doctrine right. What's the doctrine of the Lord's Supper? It comes from the Passover. Get the fellowship right. We become one body. That we may never forget him. We become one body. We've got to put relationships right with each other before we come to his table. It's a way to keep us repenting. Lest we eat and drink judgment to ourselves. Then we come to his table, proclaiming his death until he comes. But before the Jews could eat the Passover, they had to purge the leaven, the bedichat chametz. Leaven is a symbol of sin, particularly of pride, and also of false doctrine, the leaven of the Pharisees. Before we come to the Lord's table, we purge the leaven, we repent of our sins. Don't come until you've repented of your sin. It's a way he keeps us repenting. It's a way he keeps us united to each other. Additionally, before the Bedichat Chametz, the purging of leaven, there was the washing of the Yachatz ritual in the Passover today, from the Passover Haggadah, the washing of each other's feet in biblical times. Peter said, all of me, clean all of me, not just my feet. Jesus said, you're already clean because of the word. It's only your feet. Our feet is what comes in contact with the fallen world. In here, in the fellowship of God's people of the living, out there is the dead. You're handling corpses all day long. You're out there working in the nine-to-five world in an office or a hospital or a factory with unsaved people. You're working with the living dead, with zombies. They're dead. In here, you're with the live. Before you eat, if you were handling corpses all day, if you were a pathologist or an undertaker or a grave digger, what you would do is clean your hands very carefully before you ate your dinner. And so it is when we come to the Lord's table. We wash each other's feet. What does that mean? We restore each other from our contact with the world. When you're out there, what kind of a week did you have, uh, 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 Gus? 
Well, my week wasn't too bad. I was witnessing to the guy next to me, but you know that other guy on the other side, the next desk, he's got pinup girls on the wall, and he's always smoking and telling filthy jokes, and there's a, a gambling pool going on in the office, and it really drags me down. I just get so dragged down. I feel so worldly, and, and, and I try to witness, but the cigarette smoke and the cursing and the filthy jokes. And, and it's okay, brother. It won't last forever. Well, Barbara, what kind of week did you have? Well, you know, the baby's been teething and having fever. We're not getting much sleep, but I'm finding it so hard to pray. I can't spend time in the Word. I can't pray. The baby always just is at that time. Well, that's okay, dear. We all go through these things. We wash each other's feet. We refresh each other from our contact with the world before we come to the Lord's table. It's fundamental. The doctrine of the Lord's Supper must be right. The fellowship must be right. Then we have the Lord's Supper. But last is prayer. Why? Again, it's a siddur. It's an order. They were Jews following a liturgical view. Not liturgy in the ritualistic sense, but in the sense of what it means in Hebrew. Let's say that. It's a set in order. The Lord's Supper, we remember the cross, the blood. The only reason we can pray, the only reason we have access to the Father is because of the blood of the Lamb. You understand? The only reason we have that access, the only reason we can pray is because of what Jesus did. That's why the Lord's Supper precedes the prayer. That's not to say we shouldn't pray before we go out on the, into the meeting, but it is to say that the real time of, of coming together in corporate prayer, to pray corporately, you have to be in fellowship with each other. I can't stand him, I can't stand her. You can't really pray corporately then. That's got to be put right. You can't take the Lord's Supper. That's put right. Now let's understand this. The order is important. Doctrine, fellowship, Lord's Supper, prayer. Now notice, although Peter at that point, preach the kerygma. They didn't devote themselves to Peter's teaching. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. In Acts 15, at the first council, it was not Peter presiding, it was James. If Peter was the first pope, obviously Peter should have been presiding, but Peter was not the first pope. It was the apostles' teaching. It wasn't some person claiming to be infallible. Only Christ is infallible, attributing divine attributes to himself. This is Antichrist in place of Christ. They're putting a man in place of Christ. It was the apostles' teaching. In ecclesiastical polity, you will always find plurality. The apostles were sent out in pairs, but they were accountable to each other in Acts 15. It was a joint ministry in the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit had set out for me Barnabas and Saul. No one man shows. No one man shows. The senior pastor is the primus inter paris. The senior pastor, it may be the way that James is functioning as the one who presided in Acts 15, or it may be the way Peter was here in Acts 2. But he is only what we would call primus inter pares, Latin, first among equals. The way that Moses trained up Caleb and Joshua is a model of discipleship adopted in the New Testament. The way Paul trained up Timothy and Titus was the same. The idea of Moses and Joshua, that was an Old Testament principle of discipleship adopted in the New Testament. But it is not a principle of New Testament leadership. 
This idea of the pastor, the senior guy, the head honcho, he's the man. This was an error invented in the early church by someone called Ignatius of Antioch. The theological term is called mono-episcopacy. Mono-episcopacy. One dude, one overseer. Some scopus, the Greek word scopus. Not biblical. There were reasons Ignatius invented this. People were getting into all kinds of crazy doctrines, so people looked to churches where the, they, the, the churches were planted by the apostles. They would look to Jerusalem, they would look to Corinth, they would look to Antioch, they'd look to places where the apostles were like Ephesus and say, well, the church in Ephesus got their doctrine directly from, from Paul and John and Peter, so we'll go there. So we'll look to the pastor there to have right doctrine. That's why they invented it. You don't correct error with error. You correct error with truth. Monoepiscopacy gave acceleration to something that Jesus said he hated. Nicolaishianism. Nicol Laishianism, suppression of the laity people. A clergy class back under the law. Again, an Old Testament system of leadership based on the Levitical priesthood or based on the monarchy. Okay. Overlords over the people. New Testament leadership was plural. Wherever the apostles planned churches, there was a plurality. Secondly, biblical leadership was always functional and relational. It was not, absolutely not, clerical and higher archical. Biblical leadership was functional and relational. It was not clerical and not hierarchical. Every Christian is a minister. We don't all have the same ministry, but every Christian is a minister. Every Christian is a priest. If you're not a priest, you're not a Christian. Christ is the high priest. Only God can ordain a minister. Now, do I have an ordination certificate and a license? Yes. Why? Let me tell you why. Okay, I want to be in fellowship with other preachers who have the same views I have, doctrinally and so forth. I'm in a movement with mainly ex-Pentecostals who pulled out of things like the Assemblies of God and the Elam cult over the corruption and the false doctrine. I want fellowship with others, but, and they gave me a credential, but that's not why I have the credential. If it's going to help me to do the work of God, Paul says, go along with it. For me to be able to sign a, a wedding certificate, pronounce someone man and wife, for me to be able to sign a burial certificate and have somebody legally committed to the, to the earth until the resurrection, for me to get into a hospital when it's not visiting hours, for me to get into a jail, in my case, sometimes out of one, if that ordination certificate is going to practically open doors, I'm happy to have the ordination certificate. But you never see me going around calling myself reverend, even though I am one. I don't go by religious titles. Now, if it's a practical thing to, to be it, I'll do it. 
but that's not, that, it doesn't make me any more reverent than you are. I'm about as reverent as a bouncer in a burlesque show. It doesn't make me any more Christian or spiritual or higher or better than anyone. It's functional and relational. I may have a certain ministry of leadership. That doesn't make me higher than a person with a ministry of servantship. We're all called to be servants. People with the gift of helps. I'm telling you, when you get to heaven, you see the pastor God uses so much and blessed. It's the little old lady who washed the church steps, who prayed for him five hours a day. You're going to find out who's who. It's functional and relational. It doesn't make anybody in leadership any different. Now, some may be in full-time ministry, some may be in part-time ministry, but it's functional and relational. It's nothing to do whether or not you're in full-time or part-time. Some may have a theological education, some may not. But that doesn't affect the person spiritually. It's functional and relational. Only God can ordain a minister. It's functional and relational. And it's plural. When you find models of church government that are autocratic and that are hierarchical and centralized, instead of plural and functional and relational, you're looking at something unbiblical, and that church will eventually self-destroy. It will self-destroy doctrinally and then morally. It's just not biblical. As Wesley said, if this is what's happened to Methodism when I'm alive, what will happen when I'm dead? Plural. Notice biblical ecclesiology was apostolic. It was apostolic. It comes from the apostles. For instance, Jesus cast demons out so we should have a deliverance ministry. No, no, no. Jesus never cast a demon out of a believer. Not until he died and rose from the dead were there believers in the New Testament sense. No place is a demon ever cast out of a believer. And all the instruction the apostles give on how to apply and live out the teaching of Jesus, where did they ever teach deliverance? Where did they ever teach, teach casting demons out of? They never did. It's not apostolic Christianity. Deliverance is a racket and a business. It's a con job, a con game very often. It's not apostolic. All of our beliefs and practices must be apostolic. It wasn't psychologized. Biblical psychology is the book of Proverbs. It wasn't what you see today. Secular psychology using Christian jargon. It's not apostolic. Our faith is apostolic. Now understand the kinds of apostles you have and had in the book of Acts. Jesus is called ho apostolo in Greek. He is the apostle in Hebrews. The Greek word apostle is apostolo. The Hebrew word is shaliach, shaliach, one who was sent, as in the pool of Siloam, shaloach, same, same. One who was sent to plant the church. Jesus is called the apostle in Hebrews. He's unique. All other apostolic authority has to derive from him. Other apostles, okay, but he is the apostle. He's the only autocratic apostle. Nowhere do you ever see an apostle acting as one. The spirits that set out for me, Barnabas and Saul, Jesus sends them out in pairs. Okay. He's the only one who is singular in what he does, teaches. Paul and Barnabas had to report back to Antioch, give account. At Acts 15, they had to give account. They were always accountable. Apostolic authority meant and still would mean accountability. Accountability and again plurality. He is the apostle. Then you have the twelve. The twelve apostles correspond 
to the New Testament. The New Testament equivalent of the 12 patriarchs of Israel, the sons of Jacob. They're the basis. They had to be around from the baptism of John the Baptist. Even Paul could not be among the twelve, even though Paul had the same authority. Forget about people who said the apostles acted in the flesh by casting lots for Matthias. That's simply not true. Uh, Paul was not qualified to be counted among the twelve because he'd not been around from the time of John according to the book of Acts. Secondly, thirdly, sorry, we have the unique case of Paul. Like the others, he saw the Lord and received his doctrine directly from Jesus. Look at the way Paul mysteriously writes in 1 Corinthians 11 about the Last Supper. I received from the Lord that which I delivered unto you. He actually speaks about the Last Supper as if he were present. He had the same authority as the others. Barnabas may have been in the same class. But we have another category. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, please. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we read Paul's rebuke to the church there because they were following men instead of God. In verse 12, he says, I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas. I am of Paul. I'm of Cephas, that's Peter, but then you had Apollos. He didn't see the Lord. Some speculate he may have written Hebrews, but if he did, he did it under the tutelage of the others, as well as the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Apollos. Jesus is in heaven. He remains the apostle. The 12 apostles are in heaven. They remain apostles. Paul is in heaven. He's an apostle, but he's not here. The only kind of apostle that can exist today is this kind. What is this kind? A shaliak, a church planting. missionary. Somebody sent under the guidance of the Holy Spirit by one church to plant another. They exist today. There are no more Pauls, no more Peters. There will not be any more. The same as the Hebrew prophets were chosen and inspired by God to write the Old Testament, the apostles were inspired by God and chosen to write the New. The New Testament is a doctrinally complete canon. There is no more apostles, except in the sense of a church planting missionary. It's the same word in Greek and Hebrew. Does apostolic authority still exist? Yes. Where? Here, in the teaching of the apostles. Apostolic authority was the authority to define doctrine, to interpret and establish the teaching of Jesus. This is apostolic authority. This is the apostolic tradition. Not the patristic authority from the church fathers. That begins to go off. This is the apostolic authority. Yes, apostolic authority exists in what they wrote. This is it. When you see people today claiming to be apostles, look out. Now, when you send out a team to plant the church, make sure there's at least two. There's accountability and plurality. But today, you don't see that. What you see today is a deception called restorationism. Its pioneer in this country is Hudson Salisbury. In England, it's Gerald Coates, who came and falsely predicted in New Zealand the earthquake that never happened at Lake Talpo. It's Terry Virgo. It's the late Bryn Jones. It's restorationism. They tried to restore three things that never existed, based largely on a misinterpretation and mistranslation, in part, of Ephesians, of the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers. They say it's the fivefold ministry. In Greek, technically, it's four. 
but I won't go into that now. To them, it's a pyramid. It goes back to Arthur Wallace's explanation. The top is the apostle, then the prophet, etc. Then the pastor and evangelist and the rest. They say we're restoring apostolic authority. No, they're restoring something that never existed. What they are calling apostolic authority is not apostolic authority. It is what Ezekiel 34 calls heavy shepherding. Which is, among other things, a formula for financial exploitation and a lot of other things. Secondly, they have another version of prophetic authority. In the Bible, people who predict things that don't happen, as Benny Hinn has done, as uh, Kenneth Copeland has certainly done, as, above all, Rick Joyner has done, as Kansas City false prophets Mike Bickle and Paul Kane have done, as Cindy Jacobs has done, they're still considered to be prophets. No, they're false prophets. Just like the founders of Mormonism and Jehovah's Witness, they predicted things in God's name that didn't happen, were commanded to reject them. If they really repent, they'll stop trying to pretend to be prophets. They aren't. They're false prophets. What they are is soothsayers. What's today usually called prophecy is not biblical prophecy. Most of what is being passed off as prophecy today, we've warned in the past, is clairvoyance. This is restorationism. That is not biblical apostolic authority. The third thing they try to restore that's not biblical, in addition to their view of apostolic authority and their view of prophetic authority, is the Calvinistic error adopted by charismaniacs of post-millennialism. Kingdom now. Triumphalism. The idea that the church is going to conquer the whole world for Christ before he comes. There'll be no antichrist, no falling away. Revelation and Matthew 24 have no future meaning and all these other deceptions that I won't go into now. This is just lunacy. Did Jesus separate the sheep from goats in 70 AD? <laughs> That's what they think. Crazy. So, biblical ecclesiology is apostolic. But let's continue in Acts chapter 2. What do we see? Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. This is called Nisim Veniflaot, signs and wonders. Biblically, these signs follow. These signs follow. Jesus never allowed signs and wonders to be the focus of his message or his ministry. These signs follow. Jesus never had a healing crusade. He had healings, and unlike Benny Hinn, his could be medically documented. He had healings, but never a healing crusade. Jesus had miracles, but he never had a miracle crusade. He had a repentance crusade. You see people flocking to stadiums for this. You see people flocking to arenas for this. That is what Jesus said is a wicked and an adulterous generation seeking a sign. It is wickedness and adultery. It is satanic. At best, carnal. Often demonic. These signs follow. All Jesus had to do was put on a show for Herod. He wouldn't have been crucified. But he only did what he saw his father doing. God is sovereign. We cannot make these things happen. Most of what you see today is a combination of hypnotic induction combined with demonic deception, or else just pure con artistry. It's hypnotic induction combined with demonic deception, or else it's just con artistry, or some combination of the two. Now, I'm not a cessationist. The idea that the gifts of the Spirit end with the apostles is not biblical. It is a false doctrine. I believe in signs and wonders, gifts of the Spirit, understood and practiced biblically. Most of what you see today is simply not biblical. This is what's biblical, what's apostolic. We cannot make it happen, but we can prevent it from happening. 
if we had right teaching, right fellowship, remember the Lord's Supper is central to our fellowship and our worship. The focus of a service should be the Lord's Supper. It's the focus. You don't correct error with error. Because of the Roman Catholic abomination of the Mass, denying the sufficiency of Calvary, Rome said Jesus has to continue to die sacramentally. They combined this with Aristotelian philosophy, coming up with the doctrine of transubstantiation, which is debunked by modern science, leading to the idolatry and cannibalism of the Mass. So to correct this idolatry and cannibalism, Protestantism played down the Lord's Supper only doing it once a quarter or on special occasions or in some cases once a year. No, no. It should be done regularly. You don't correct error with error. You correct error with truth. It's the center of our worship. If you had right teaching, right fellowship, right worship, and right prayer, as in thy will be done, not my will, I believe God for that Mercedes. Right teaching, right fellowship, right worship, right prayer, we would see more biblical manifestations of the gifts of the Spirit. You can't make it happen, but you can block it. By having wrong teaching, wrong fellowship, wrong worship, wrong prayer, you can block the authentic. So people wind up going to Pensacola, Florida, or Toronto, Canada for a counterfeit, because they don't have the real. They don't have what's genuine, because they're blocking it. Get this right, and then the Holy Spirit can work. But in this ecclesiology, we see something. Again, I always quote my favorite rabbi, Where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. My favorite rabbi is Rabbi Yeshua Bar Yosef, me that said it, Jesus of Nazareth. Nothing will show our attitude towards God more than our attitude towards wealth and possessions. And those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing with them all as anyone might have need. Corporate living, communal living. Sometimes Jesus said, come, join my merry band of men. But with the woman at the well, he said, no, go back to your community. With the demoniac again, Serene, who Jesus saved from that demonic possession, Jesus said, no, go back. Don't come with us. Stay here and tell the people. We're not all called to live that way, but we're all called to be willing to live that way. Now, understand why they lived that way in the book of Acts, in the beginning of the book of Acts. The reason they lived that way is this. If Jesus Christ came to your town and said, this whole place is going to be ransacked in an invasion, stick together and prepare to leave town, wouldn't you put your house on the market? <laughs> Move down to the church. When I give you the signal, get out. And that's what happened under Simeon after James was martyred. Simeon was the cousin of Jesus, a leader of the church in Jerusalem. And in 70 AD, as you read about in Eusebius and Josephus, they escaped. They actually thought it was the rapture. Actually, it was a type of prefiguring of the rapture. They got out of there. The place was going to be destroyed, so they began selling their property. There was a reason. The Lord might lead you to do it in a given situation. However, there's a danger when you live cor corporately or communally. Social parasitism. This became a problem in Thessalonica. Paul had to say, if you don't work, you should not eat. It was people who just looked for a free ride on the back of the church. Paul had to make the distinction between widows and widows indeed, those who should be financially assisted by the church and those who should not. So we're all together, Jesus is coming soon. They thought he was going to come in their lifetime, although they allowed for the possibility he might not. And uh, the apostles were their teachers and their pastors. Everything swelled. People are getting saved. They forgot about being his witnesses in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. They never got out of Jerusalem. While the Lord delivered Peter from prison, he didn't deliver 
Stephen. He allowed Stephen to be martyred because it made the church get moving. God put an end to their communal living. That's the danger. You get introspective. You lose your capacity to relate to unsaved people. It's how God leads in the given time. I've lived that way, and I've lived not that way. Now, in Africa, we have a children's village called Ebion. And we have orphanages for little babies with AIDS. Our missionaries take care of these little babies that unless Jesus, unless Jesus heals them, they're going to be dead before the age of eight or nine. We just take care of them. Our missionaries give them as much love. We put them in a family environment instead of an institutional environment and teach them about Jesus. You're going to be with Jesus soon. And by the age of eight or nine, they do. Our missionaries share their computers. Where they share the toothpaste, they share their money, they share everything. They live that way. It's the right way for them to live. Are we all called to live that way? No. Are we all called to be willing to live that way? Yes. Should the need arise and the Lord so lead. Are we all called to pray for and financially support those who do live that way in the mission field for the sake of the gospel? Absolutely. Absolutely. We don't have a single model in the book of Acts of the way a church should be. In Acts alone, we have three identifiable models. We have the Jerusalem model, the Antioch model, and the Greek model. However, the principles of koinonia, of shoot the foot, of fellowship, the fundamentals of ecclesiology will be the same in each of them. Now, there's one final thing we need to look at in this passage we've just read. It says they met in the temple and house to house. They met in the temple and house to house. That's important. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. How can you continually devote yourself to fellowship, as it says they did? Well, you can continually devote yourself to prayer by praying all the time, even when you're driving to work. You can continually devote yourself to teaching by living it out. But how do you continually devote yourself to fellowship? There's only one way. In 1 John, we are told this. In God, we, of course, have fellowship. He himself is in the light. We have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. This is the message you've heard, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in light as he himself was in the light, we have fellowship with one another. You can't always be in vertical relationships but you can always be in a horizontal one. If you are in vertical fellowship with Jesus through the Holy Spirit, you are automatically in horizontal ones. Okay? You're automatically in horizontal ones. Okay. Continually devoted to fellowship, you can always be in fellowship with Jesus. Then we're automatically in fellowship with each other. We'll want to meet with other Christians. House to house and in the temple with one mind. Well, how can you have one mind when people have different views? It's easy to have same doctrine if you're all trusting the same Holy Spirit to guide you through the same scriptures. But some people like hymns and some people like choruses. How do you have one mind? I have my mind, you have your mind. What is the mind of Christ? <laughs> it's in the temple and house to house. Notice they took the Lord's Supper house to house. Who says we have to have the Lord's Supper on Sunday in a building? There are things you can only achieve in a large group, the temple. A, large, a crowd draws a crowd, an evangelistic outreach. In the temple. It makes a statement to the community. 
If you get a large enough group of people together, they can fund the missions program, they can begin a Christian school. I'm in favor of putting Christian teachers into state schools and getting Christian children out of them. Temple. There are things that can only be done in big groups. Bring in an outside speaker, things like that. But house to house, there are things that can only be done in small groups. Real fellowship can never take place in the temple, in a big group. Real fellowship can only take place house to house. Ten, twelve people gathered around the Lord's table in a house. Somebody is never going to develop their gifts in the temple. You try to play the piano, your brain will become disconnected with your fingers. If you try to preach, your knees will be knocking and you'll be stuttering too much. You discover and develop your gifts in small groups. There's things you can only do in small groups and things you can only do in big ones. There's a dynamic. House to house and in the temple. There's times to meet in small groups and there's times to come together. Whether or not it's in a church building is irrelevant. The house is the basis. The early Christians understood that. Taking their meals to live with gladness, fellowship meals, agapes, love feasts, praising God and having favor with all the people. Not necessarily the religious establishment. If you live out biblical ecclesiology, if you live out New Testament Christianity, you're not going to have favor with the religious establishment or the institutional churches. But you will have favor with the people. <laughs> Jesus never came to establish his denomination. I'll leave you with one last thing. When you have unity of the Spirit, when you have real fellowship, when you have a real biblical ecclesiology, church is either the local fellowship, the local congregation, or the universal body of Christ. All you need is a fellowship of fellowships. The Plymouth Brethren understood that at one time. The Baptists understood that at one time. Calvary chapels understood that. You have a fellowship of fellowships. Because you have a unity of the Spirit based on a common doctrine, one faith, one baptism. Once an organization begins to fragment doctrinally and spiritually, you will see it will become more united organizationally, politically. It will become more autocratic, more centralized, more denominational. When you see a movement becoming a denomination, it is dying spiritually and ultimately it will die morally. They tried to compensate for the lack of unity of the spirit with an institutional unity. <laughs> like the Church of England or the Roman Church, you hold it together with property trusts, you hold it together with pension funds, you hold it together with money, with laws. But then, why? Because it's no longer held together by the Holy Spirit. Once you see something denominationalizing and becoming hierarchical, once the autonomy of the local fellowship is eroded, once a movement becomes hierarchical and centralized, it is declining spiritually. It's no longer spiritually united, so they're trying to compensate for the lack of real unity with an institutional unity. And so we have biblical ecclesiology. I've got to be honest. In New Zealand, I've met many true Christians. In Great Britain, I've met many true Christians. In Australia, I've met many true Christians. In the United States and in Canada, I've met many true Christians. In South Africa, I've met many true Christians. I've met many true Christians in many countries. Switzerland, Israel, all over. I've met true believers. Many true Christians. But the only places I have seen true Christianity is either where the church is persecuted and or impoverished. Oh, I've seen true Christians in America or New Zealand or Britain. I've seen true Christians in South Africa or Australia. I've seen people who love the Lord, who believe the truth. I've seen true Christians. But true Christianity? The closest thing I've seen true Christianity in the Western world is usually prison fellowships, people saved in the joint. 
and they've been doctrinally corrupted by Colson and ecumenism. If you want to see true Christianity, come with me to the Middle East. I'll show you true Christianity in the Persian Gulf. Come with me to our mission stations and our orphanages in Africa. I will show you true Christianity in the third world. I will show you our missionaries. I'll show you true Christianity in Kenya or in other places of the third world. I'll show you true Christianity. I've seen true Christianity where the church is impoverished and more so where it's persecuted. Here in your country and in other countries like it in the developed world, I have not seen true Christianity. I've only seen true Christians. But before Jesus comes back, and if persecution is what it takes, that's what it's going to take. I'm not praying for persecution by any means. Right now, we only have true Christians. Before Jesus comes back, we are going to have true Christianity. God bless. Blessings, dear friends. Greetings of Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print for the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kendall and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon, and they're available through Kendall. Kendall. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. First being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea. It's an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen, will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of Revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church, Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Parpezzo, Parpezzo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available in the Morio catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless, and Jesus be with you.